everyone, and welcome to this New Hampshire Archaeological Society 2021 Archaeology Month presentation. My name is George LeDuc, Vice President of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society. Today, we are very excited to welcome Doug Dickinson and John Schleifer, who will speak on historic archaeology in Wilmington, North Carolina. Doug has been a longtime volunteer in SCRAP beginning in the 1990s. And John is the executive director of the Public Archaeology Corps in Wilmington. Welcome to you both. Thank you. And thank you. We've had a little bit of technical problems with the video that um, John and Doug are going to share. So bear with us. Um, John is going to give us an introduction and, and share the video. It may be a little haunting and he may need to do a voiceover of his own instead of, uh, instead of listening to the audio. But thank you for being flexible and uh, we'll give it a shot. Okay. Hi everybody. Um, I am uh, John Schleier. I am the, uh, the as Deb said, the, uh, and George said, the Executive Director of Public Archaeology Corps. Uh, we're a Wilmington-based nonprofit, um, and our nonprofit was formed to uh, address the issue of archaeological site loss on privately owned land, um, as you'll hopefully hear in the video. Okay, so this is the um, this is Front Street, just outside the site. Okay. So this is the approach leading up to the site. Um, the warehouse that you're looking at is a circa 1850s uh, build. You can see it's it's been crumbling. Um, it's going to get a massive facelift in the near future. There's our block. Let's see how we have our screen set up. It's a 15 by 25 foot block consisting of 15 five foot by five foot test units. Uh, that second room there, uh, we are hoping to excavate that in the future, uh, but we're kind of focusing on that first block. All those girders were put in to kind of support the building. Uh, it was uh, during the first phase of construction. As you can see, we're a family friendly organization. Okay, so I'm introducing myself here. I um, mean, uh, I'm explaining my day job. I'm an archaeologist at uh, Fort Bragg Cultural Resources. Um, I'm from New York originally. I got my bachelor's degree at Franklin Pierce College when it was Franklin Pierce College, now Franklin Pierce University, as you all know. Uh, completed my degree in 1998. Uh, was uh, my mentor was Dr. Howard Hecker, whom some of you may know. I shovel bombed. I did contract archaeology for several years, and uh, I wound up in North Carolina. <laughs> All right, so I'm explaining uh, Pat's origins, dealing with um, um, the issue of archaeological sites on privately owned land. Uh, there's no legal protections uh, for sites in those locations. And 
basically utilizing the approach of a nonprofit to try to work with landowners and developers to uh, help kind of protect and or mitigate sites that are in the line of construction. Um, we work with landowners who are curious about features they may have on their property and would like to see them excavated. Uh, we do everything on a volunteer base, uh, a volunteer driven basis. Uh, we take people who are completely untrained from the public and we work with them on, on, on weekends. We've We've been active for about eight years. We've done about a dozen projects. So reiterating the fact that this, this building was built in about 1850. It was used as a peanut processing, uh, de-hulling, and perhaps a distribution warehouse. Um, I noted that we found a, uh, actually found a uh, peanut husk during the first phase of our work. So in the late 1800s, early 1900s, this building and most of the block that the building sat on um, was purchased by a business called Jacoby Warehouse. Uh, Jacoby Hardware. They used the um, the site as a warehouse. During the 1980s, the Jacoby Hardware building burned down. Um, the Jacoby Hardware building stood in that parking lot, which you'll remember seeing from the introduction as we were walking up to it, burned to the ground. Uh, there are several kind of indicators of the fire's influence on the building, if you kind of watch the video, you can see some burnt timber slots, stuff like that. Um, it stood in a state of dilapidation for about 30 years until it was bought by the current landowner who was very passionate about historic preservation. Um, and uh, he, he decided he wants to build a restaurant on the parking lot where Jacoby Hardware once stood and even though it was recommended to him to demolish this current building, which was in a horrible state of dilapidation, um, he opted to do this extensive treatment with putting these girders in that you can see to support the walls. Um, and he's gonna use it for kind of an outdoor courtyard seating type thing for the restaurant. Um, and we're also going to be digging in the parking lot when uh, when they when they when it comes time to build there. Um, and I'm just saying that we would expect to see in that parking lot we would expect to see the same sequence of occupation, basically building on top of building on top of building, the kind of thing that you see in a um, an urban environment here, you know, three centuries of construction all on top of each other. Okay, now I'm explaining that we were first approached um, about digging on this site by Christopher, Christopher Yermel, who is the owner of Old School Rebuilders, LLC, and his, his, um, his firm does uh, basically, it, he works with the landowner uh, to do rebuilding and refurnishing on, on old buildings that kind of need a rehab. They were doing compaction testing for the girders. Um, and when they were doing the construction, the, the compaction testing, they needed to basically dig out with a backhoe. They were coming across a ton of artifacts. So they contacted, they had heard about Public Archaeology Corps and they contacted me by email and sent pictures of all these artifacts. And, uh, you know, they asked if we were interested in coming to, to do a dig. Uh, and I replied, yes, absolutely. So we went and we were unable to kind of access the middle of the floor at that time or the middle of the room at that time because it was covered in back dirt from the trenches. 
So we kind of just tested along the walls where the trenches were excavated to try to figure out the depth of deposits. Uh, and they were deep. They went down a few feet. Uh, we saw enough. Now the first, the first couple layers were scooped out as part of the trenching. But we had uh, uncovered enough during our initial phase that we were able to determine that there was a very rich occupation of this site uh, going back through into colonial times. Uh, we couldn't really do any sequencing or try to figure out how intact all the occupations were because, you know, we were just taking a very small sample. And uh, yeah, I'm still explaining the phase one efforts, pretty much the grid phase one efforts. Um, so uh, last year during, you know, the COVID shutdown and everything, he uh, approached me again and let me know that the construction had been halted uh, into the far future. We still don't have a resumption of construction date. So uh, they invited us to come back and continue to dig and of any sites that we've done, I feel like this one benefits the most from this kind of uh, concentrated effort. It's pretty much the equivalent of a phase three mitigation data recovery uh, type excavation. So the goal, the, the thought is by opening up a 15 by 25 foot block excavation, we're gonna get uh, most of the room that, uh, that is, you know, contains undisturbed deposits. And by opening up this kind of block excavation, we can try to suss out the different occupations um, therein. So basically at this point, we have worked out that the first three layers, which we are digging in half foot layers, uh, the first three layers are basically concerning the warehouse, its construction, its use, and its demolition. At this point, largely across the site in the block, we are down to the base of that occupation. We're now starting to move into uh, that pre-1850s area. So we're starting to get a lot of artifacts that are earlier 1800s, later 1700s. Um, as you may know, with urban archaeology and historics, historic artifacts in general, you kind of get a lot of diagnostics coming out. They seem to be stratified in a way, um, aside from the obvious disturbance that comes with, you know, people living on the land for centuries. But by and large, we seem to be getting a sequence of artifacts. So yeah, now I'm explaining the colonial layer that we're starting to find ourselves in. Our deeper, our deepest unit is now starting to get into something um, earlier, um, which I can actually explain afterwards because the video doesn't cover that. This is just stuff that happened literally yesterday. So we'll get into that after the video. Um, our goal is to do as much work on the site as we can before construction resumes. We're focusing on the first block. We're going to try to get that excavated all the way down. And then if we still have, we're going to chase it until the bottom. And then if we still have time, then we're going to shift into that second room that you saw um, that's still covered with grass. And if we have time, we'll give that a thorough treatment as well. Okay, here comes the highlight reel of some artifacts. So the first artifact that we're going to highlight was a, a, a ceramic bowl. Well, not really a bowl. It's kind of square sided. It could have been something in the lines of a candy dish or something along that. Um, that was the position that we found it in, uh, that what I'm doing with my hands there. Uh, we had found one half of it in the first layer and the second half, um, which is on the table there, we found in the very top of the second level. So we kind of uh, pedestaled a little bit and um, some volunteers had fun bringing that up. 
that is a, uh, I believe we looked at the maker's mark and that was a late 1800s piece. So now when we found that artifact there, I, my first thought was like, you know, I wonder if it's like a grinding stone, something along those lines. But it was actually Doug um, who, who uh, spoke up because he had, uh, he, he'd seen examples of this in the past and actually work that he's done with you guys up there with scrap. Uh, it is a hinge stone, so it would have been set down in the ground, and they would have had one hinge of the door in the factory, in the warehouse or whatever. Yeah, there's a kid cheesing in the background. <laughs> and uh, you would have opened and closed it um, as a pivot point, which explains the very tight groove. If it was a, a grindstone or a monomatado type thing, you would have it uh, a lot more of a, a gradual groove on it, more worn area. This is so focused. And the fact that we found it in the unit that is closest to the door frame also gives us a little indicator. This was a really cool artifact. I've always suspected that we had a pre-contact uh, pre presence on site. This is our first hard piece of evidence determining that. We found that in the base of level three, which is kind of the division between the 1850s, pre-1850s period. Um, it is a, uh, when I first saw it, I thought, okay, um, it has to be something historic because we literally found it with a bunch of, in, in a bunch of, you know, historic artifacts. Um, but you know, even though my gut told me it was pre-contact, I looked it up afterwards, um, and it closely resembled a Southern barbed ax. Um, what I'm doing right there is I'm showing how much we're actually missing. There's only a little bit missing off the front there. Um, so it's been eroded. It's been used, probably reused a lot. Um, the artifact type has been recovered from basically all through the Southwest and into Michigan, but its origins are traced to the Southeast. Um, I haven't been able to get a good firm date on that yet with my research, but still kind of working on that. So, as I said, that's our first pre-contact, and I'm pretty excited about it. That is just your textbook, perfect little hand-blown piece of, you know, mid-1800s, early-1800s uh, bottle glass. It's dark olive green. Um, you can see the base there. It's got kind of a little pontal scarring on the base. Um, it's one of the standard artifacts that we find on the site. We've gotten a lot of them. Okay, there is a lovely example of a bone button. Uh, we're calling it basically a 19th century bone button. It was in test unit eight. It was in the fourth level. So this is as we're starting to get a little deeper and starting to move into the layer, into the levels beneath the current warehouse. So we're tracking an early 1800s date for that. Very cool artifact. It's a Spanish real. I don't know how much you can make on that, but we have, um, uh, we had kind of a crest on there. Uh, we got Charles the Fourth written on there. I don't know if you could make that out. It's very corroded. Um, but basically, we were able to uh, do a little research, and we we uh, were able to uh, pin it down to kind of 1790s to 1810 time period. And that was in that um, I believe that was in the fourth level of that test unit eight. Uh, test unit eight is is uh, kind of the unit that we were digging uh, a little further down to try to get an advanced look of that 18, 1700s occupation. Um, an eagle coin from the late 19th century, very corroded. Again, we've uh, started kind of trying to give it a little bit of a lemon wash treatment to try to get some of the corrosion, but we still have a lot of work to go on it. Um, but you can see, I mean, you can see the eagle wings and a little bit of laurels right there. Yeah. Good stuff. Ginger beer bottles. We are getting uh, a lot of ginger beer bottles. 
The cool thing about these particular ones that I'm showing right now is, uh, as you can see, and as I'm demonstrating, they refit. They were found from a couple of different adjoining units. Um, our screeners kind of keep a weather eye out while they're working and uh, they enjoy puzzles. They try to uh, do their best to try to do refits. We have actually quite a few pieces that uh, we actually feel confident we can get some decent refits and um, some reconstructions. So yeah, there you go. Um, that actually represents one bottle, but uh, we feel pretty confident with uh, the fact that we probably have a dozen of them on site from different areas of the block excavation. There is our ream of pipe stems. This is just a small sample of what we've, we've recovered. Uh, we actually hit quite a dense midden of them um, in level four and level five in test unit eight. Um, I'm kind of theorizing that maybe this, uh, what we're getting into in those deeper levels is a, uh, a tavern, perhaps tavern trash midden. Uh, we're getting a lot of bone. We're getting a lot of shell in with these pipe stems. So there's no doubt there's some sort of a midden activity going on. Uh, this piece that I have in my hands right now is a socket end. So it's, it's not the actual pipe bowl, but it's where the stem would have met into the bowl. It's a lovely little teacup. It's got a lot of hand printed design on it. Um, it's another um, refittable, reconstructable item. These are just a few of the shirts that we found from it. We've actually recovered a few more. And as I said, our screeners and our volunteers, they are, they are big puzzle junkies and they love to do reconstructions and kind of see if, uh, if pieces will refit as they're coming out of the ground and they're uh, coming up in the screener. So there I am conjecturing at the late 18th century date. There's Dougie. Oh God! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you can hear me, I was saying hello everyone up there in New Hampshire. I am glad to be here, <laughs> but wouldn't mind spending a little time up there. I became involved with PAC after learning about it, working on a historic site called Brunswick Town or Old Brunswick Town, which was being run by Eastern Carolina University, ECU. And that is a time period of 1760-ish. We uncovered a definite tavern there. So the parallels of what we found at Brunswick Town seem to run here at our Wilmington site. Someone at the Brunswick town mentioned PAC and I went, whoa, okay, here's another place I could maybe go digging. So I emailed John Schleier once I got the particulars and uh, that has started our going on two and a half year relationship now, I guess. Yeah. So. It's Time good. <laughs> <laughs> There's young Mike, Mike Castleton Jr. He's one of our younger members. Um, he's in his early 20s. Sadly, just uh, left us. His last uh, dig day was um, this past Saturday. He's left to take a job in St. Louis. Um, we were his first encounter with archaeology. He's been he volunteering with us for uh, almost two years, uh, two and a half years, kind of the same length as Dougie. Uh, we gave him that first trowel. He's been maintaining it like a craftsman. Uh, he's decided because of volunteering with us that he wants to go to school for archaeology.
he uh, is fascinated by digging and unearthing things from the past um, and kind of, uh, you know, advancing the knowledge of what we have and knowing about the past. He found that bone button that we saw earlier, you know, thrill of discovery. He enjoys it a lot. Most fun he's had in a while. And that's pretty much it. Uh, there we are. One final view of the parking lot. Fast forward into the site. Loveliness, loveliness, into the site, motion sickness. <laughs> There's our tops. One last look at everything, our adjunct screening station. And uh, that is pretty much it. That's a wrap. All right, I'm going to stop the share. And here we are. Good job, John. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, and now for some questions from the chat. Um, how do you build support in the community for public archaeology? Well, we have a, a few kind of methods that we've used over the past several years. Um, we had been active on Facebook for a while, but we've kind of scaled back on that just because we've kind of found Facebook to be a toxic place these days. Um, how we've been, um, we've been using news outlets a lot. Uh, we're very friendly with the local newspapers and the local TV stations. Uh, they are, they are very keen to cover archeological stories because it gives them good, uh, it gives, uh, them good viewership. It's something interesting for the reporters to cover and it, it gets uh, gets our news and our mission out there to everybody. I mean, hands down, there's, there's no doubt there's always a huge flurry of activity and interest after we do a news story. So that's a, that's a big way. I'll probably be going back to doing Facebook again, uh, maybe starting an Instagram, trying to hit our socials a little better. Um, we also have a web page. Uh, publicarchaeology.org and uh, we've actually gotten a lot of support for this site just from our email list and our membership uh, which we have a membership program as well okay uh, do you run a lab to process and catalog the collection and where will it be curated okay so uh we're still working a lot of things out. Um, as of now, I have a, uh, a curation facility that is in my house. It's in my, uh, I've converted a room over uh, to basically be an ad hoc curation facility. Uh, we have all the uh, proper storage. We have, you know, all the proper acid-free boxes, bags. We do a lot of volunteer processing. Uh, we've been hosted many times by the UNCW, uh, University of North Carolina at Wilmington, a UNCW archeology span lab. Um, we've done a lot of work there and we're able to kind of interface with volunteers there. We're kind of hoping in the future to be able to get a, uh, a facility of our own that we can use to kind of interface with, with, uh, with volunteers on a more frequent basis. But as of right now, I'm kind of doing the lion's share of cleaning and processing and classification on my own. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not the best situation or the most ideal, but we're working towards kind of a, a better thing as we go. Uh, okay, um, I think you might've mentioned this in the presentation, but someone's asking um, how will the site be used when it's developed? So once the site is developed, that whole dilapidated building that you saw that has uh, just gotten, you know, kind of the support from the girders and all that, they're going to give it a complete facelift. Uh, they're going to basically use it for an outdoor dining area. The parking lot is going to be built up, built up with a new building that is going to 
uh, kind of replicate what the old building looked like, the Jacoby Hardware building. They're going to go to great lengths to kind of reconstruct at least the facade of the building. When the restaurant will be in there, and then the building where we're working is going to be used for the outdoor dining. They're even talking about in that second room doing some sort of mezzanine seating with a, a partial roof so that you can eat out there when it's rainy or what have you. Uh, so, and, and also we're working out with the owner and the developer uh, putting a, a permanent exhibition on site of the things that we found and the, uh, the work that we did there. Well, that's great that they're working to preserve that building because once it's gone, uh, it's no bringing it back. Exactly, exactly. It's, uh, it's going above and beyond, no doubt. And so many areas that have done extensive uh, urban renewal uh, have torn down some buildings that they wish they had not torn down now in hindsight anyway. Um, exactly. Any new exciting finds that didn't make it into the video? Uh, well, there's actually a few. I mean, that site just keeps on giving. Um, one thing that we found actually just after we had shot the video was uh, a copper, what we believe is a copper wine tap. It was a, uh, it, I mean, it looks like just like something that you would have put into a little wine cask. Uh, and I think we actually found examples online of the same design. Uh, so we feel pretty good that it is a wine tap. Um, also kind of an interesting thing that I alluded to during the presentation, not necessarily a, a, an interesting artifact, but we, uh, I, I had spoken the, during the video of the test unit that we we're digging a little deeper to try to chart out ahead and figure out how thick of an, you know, where the next occupation begins. Uh, we hit this dark soil, which the midden was in. And at the base of that dark soil, we had hit kind of natural looking soil, very homogenous, kind of gritty, sandy. And I thought, okay, well, we're through it. That's a little anticlimactic, but whatever. So at the beginning of the day yesterday, Doug had brought his soil probe. So he got down there in the unit and started probing downwards, took about um, maybe two full probes down, and we hit an organic layer, a buried, maybe on what I'm presuming is a buried A horizon. And there is a small little tiny historic ceramic shirt in there. So, uh, and that's, you know, so we're talking now a total depth of a few feet down, uh, probably four feet down. We're still finding stuff. Yep. It was a huge surprise to me because I thought the unit was done and we were in natural soil, but apparently it's just some sort of a fill over a buried A horizon where there's yet more historic uh, artifacts. And in one section of the probe, I think it was the second uh, probe punch, uh, we came up the same dark soil, but with wood very soft pieces of wood mm -hmm. so um that got bagged obviously <laughs> yes so there, it's going to keep on going and here i thought we would be chasing some prehistoric stuff but <laughs> <laughs> um, there's still hope for that <laughs> yes i have a question for doug uh how is digging different with PAC compared to digging with scrap? Probably the main difference is the time period where scrap, the vast majority of the sites were prehistoric. Uh, we don't have that here yet. So it's been the historic only that I've been involved with. I'm hoping that by connections with other people, we will be able to further explore uh, potential prehistoric sites. There are some in the area. I just have to educate myself as to where and when. Okay. Um, have uh, This is for John, I guess, or either one. Uh, have any artifacts been found that might possibly show uh, an African American presence? 
Um, nothing specific. Uh, we've been on the lookout for Kelowna ware, which is a specific uh, ceramic type uh, made by enslaved African Americans. Uh, we haven't found any yet. Uh, basically, all everything that we're finding is it's, it's kind of like the the the, the generic you know uh, artifacts that you would find in an urban environment. You can't really pin it down to a certain ethnicity that we can tell. Um, it's very possible, you know, that there could have been a presence there, especially during the construction of the warehouse. I really wouldn't be surprised at all if there was, um, you know, an African-American presence on site during that time. Uh, but we don't have any artifacts where we can say 100%, um, you know, identify that presence. But we are on the lookout. And am I correct in saying that... Um... You are curating everything that's found here uh, on your own premises or your own self. It's not going to the landowner or. That's correct. That's correct. And uh, usually when we, so when we work with a landowner or a developer on working on a site, uh, we have only, you know, no claim on the artifacts that we come up with. The only thing that we ask uh, and really, it's 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 it, it kind of our participation is is required uh, by this clause is that we are able to analyze the artifacts that come up. So if if uh, if we're working with a landowner and and he or she wants the artifacts back, which actually hasn't for the most part hasn't been the case, but we have to at least be given a chance to document, take pictures, uh, record metrics, that kind of stuff. Uh, before things are returned. Uh, the only time that that's actually come up was we were doing a, a, another dig a few years ago uh, downtown and the landowner wanted part of the collection back. So he kind of wanted the high, the, the dozen or two, dozen or two dozen, you know, sexiest artifacts from the collection. So we just doubled down on, you know, uh, photography and recording metrics and did what we could with them and then returned them over to the landowner. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, we, we handle our own curation. Um, we do have some volunteers who are skilled in artifact analysis. I do have laboratory experience myself. So yeah, we kind of move forward with that. Um, has PAC done any work in the historic district? Um, actually, yes. That site is in the historic district. Um, we've done, gosh, probably about th three projects in the Wilmington Historic District. And we, uh, we actually had a cordial relationship with the uh, historic preservation officer for Wilmington uh, for a while. She has since retired. I don't know personally the, the current uh, historic preservation officer, but I'm sure we'll be acquainted soon. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you have a gold mine there. Oh, it's it's wonderful. I mean, you literally can't stick a shovel on the ground in Wilmington and not find an artifact. So it's a, it's a perfect place for an organization like ours to find use. Okay, at this moment, there's one more question. Um, someone wants to know, how do you attract volunteers? Well, uh, you know, kind of referencing back to the earlier answer, uh, whenever we hit a news story, uh, you know, we, we definitely work the look. It is a, a mutually beneficial relationship, and we always have a flood of interest, um, and it's a good way to hit, like, new channels uh, by people who just, you know, are watching the news and see one of our stories, and they always give the contact information. Uh, we also work a lot from word of mouth. We have a lot of volunteers who are um, very passionate about working with us and they'll tell other people. We've had family members of volunteers show up. So we kind of have a little cascading effect going. Um, and, and point of fact, like volunteerism is something that we do not lack. We, we always have a lot of interest and a lot of people who are willing to help us. And it's been, been great so far as that's concerned. Good. Uh, would you ever consider teaching a field school? 
Uh, well, yeah. I mean, so one of the things that we that we do provide, uh, we, we don't have like an accredited field school per se, but we do work with uh, people who are uh, like students from UNCW who are archaeology majors and anthropology majors looking to get some field experience. And this kind of gives um, those students a leg up when it comes to entering the job market, particularly if they're going to go into CRM, um, even grad schools, you know, it just gives them a little bit of extra field experience that the other applicants don't have. Um, I did do a little bit of kind of cursory research into what it would take to teach a field school. Um, I'm holding a master's degree right now. I'm not actually sure if you have to have, uh, although we do have some um, PhD professors from UNCW who are uh, very active with us and who have sat on the board for years. So it's actually, you know, a possibility if we could do it, I would love to do it. Very good. Well, it looks like that's the end of the questions. So uh, we can start closing out. Uh, hold on, I think I see something else here. Um, someone said, I think you need to do a vacation archaeology for those of us in the colder climates. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's no doubt. If you want to come down here, I mean, put, put your name on the email notification. You know, we put out, uh, we put out blasts uh, whenever we're going to be in the field. This project, like I said, there's no, there's no closing date on this project. We are working on an every other Saturday basis. Um, we were in the field last Saturday. Next Saturday will be off. The Saturday after that will be on. So, uh, you know, stick your name on the notification list and come on down. You'll be more than welcome. No vacation. Oh, yeah. Well, sounds good. Vacation. And, you know, the climate is down here. We can stay. We can stay digging. Actually, it's my preference. Um, I'm from upstate New York. Uh, lived in New Hampshire for years. It's my preference to work in the winter time because it's not like winter up there. It's actually a dream down here during the winter. So it sure is. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay then. Um, thank you, Doug and John, for your presentation. We really have enjoyed talking with you today and appreciate your participation in the NHAS 2021 Archaeology Month series.